Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Today we want to have a conversation about disabilities and the church. I'm Jeff Frazier. I serve as lead pastor at Chapel Street Church, and I'm joined by Chris Duffy and Jillian Love. So why don't you each take a minute and introduce yourselves. Jillian. <laughs> My name is Jillian Love. Um, our daughter, Kendall Love, has been in the Masterpiece Ministry here for about four, maybe five years now. And Kendall has a dual diagnosis of cerebral palsy and autism. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I'm, you also yeah. have another child. Oh, yeah. We have <laughs> Brooks. Brooks. Yeah. Brooks is our typical, and he's going to be five in August. Yeah, and I'm Chris Duffy. So I'm the director of our disability ministry, which is called Masterpiece. And I've been on staff for about five years, going on five years, probably been volunteering with the ministry longer than that. And part of Chapel Street Church. Since, yeah, since 84 is when I got dragged here by Mrs. Strecker. So, <laughs> yes, I've yeah. been around. Maybe uh, just to set the table for our conversation, the term disabilities, what does or doesn't that refer to? What do we mean when we talk about disabilities? Yeah, I mean, that, and the, the language is constantly changing. So yeah. even in some things you'll read special needs, some people will say disability, and really disability runs the gamut, whether it, it could be like a physical disability that's very obvious, like Kendall, sometimes it's pretty obvious because she uses a device to help her with mobility. Um, but it also could be an invisible disability, like somebody who isn't neurotypical. Um, so somebody that's maybe on the autism spectrum, but is verbal, right? And so it's, it runs the gamut from just neurodivergent to actual physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, for each of us to take a minute and just, how, how did this first come on your radar? Is something you cared about, want to be involved in, or pay attention to? I mean, it might be most obvious for you, Julia. <laughs> um, well, for me, I really hadn't had much experience working with or being around anyone really with a disability. I mean, aside from at school when you might see um, someone who is using a walker or a wheelchair, but in my personal life, I hadn't until we had our daughter, Kendall. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, a very traumatic birth experience with her that resulted in oxygen deprivation. and. Um, she ended up spending two months in the NICU before she came home. And at that point, we were kind of uh, thrust into this world of what all the things that she might need and um, all the specialists and all the therapy visits and just trying to understand how we could best support her and give her what she needs so that she could have a, a happy life as typical as it could possibly be. So, But that was our very first experience with it. The birth of the first child is is traumatic and life-changing no matter what. I can't imagine what that was like for you. Uh, Kendall is amazing for those. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's uh, obviously, I think the one thing that Kendall's taught us the most is that um, even though she has physical limitations and as Chris maybe mentioned there that she's nonverbal, she uses a device to communicate, but she has the most amazing personality. Mm -hmm. She has her own sense of humor. Um, she is very easy. She's very lovable and easy to make anyone around her laugh and smile. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we know there are th extra things that she needs to give her access to just um, be in the world. Mm -hmm. And but at the end of the day, she's just an amazing little person. And mm -hmm. anyone who gets to know her loves her. That's right. How about you, Chris? Yeah, I mean, so probably 10 years ago was when Buddy Break at Chapel Street started. And at the time I had been involved mainly serving with like middle school and high school kids as a volunteer and then it turned out that Noah my oldest son my middle child wanted to serve at buddy break but you have to be 16 at the time you had to be 16 or a parent had to come with you and so I kind of just got dragged along and so I just showed up and that kind of was my on-ramp into the disability space here at the church and really um, God equipping me and giving me a passion for it but then I look back and part of my story is um, like historically if I really think back through high school and things like that, like I had a job at Rich Wrap, which, you know, the brewmakers mm -hmm. used to own and they used to employ people from AID. So we'd have a whole assembly line of people that had disabilities, even in high school, working with them. And it's interesting because I didn't really necessarily notice it at the time. Like I just interacted with them. Um, but it's interesting to think about that I landed here mm -hmm. after having that exposure and then just some fr friends and like middle school or grade school that had disabilities that I didn't really, wasn't necessarily on my radar, but they were there. I was in proximity to them. So I just showed up for buddy break and then here I am. <laughs> you are right. Now you're, now you're stuck with me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're happily stuck with you. 
for me, uh, um, really wasn't something I, I mean, I had a, a good friend in high school who was paralyzed in a football, in football. And so from a distance, that tragedy. And so he went from a person, uh, you know, with ability to disability instantly. And I, um, but it didn't, as a pastor and administrator, I didn't think about it much at all until we started taking it seriously here. Um, and it became part of a, a ministry area that's grown. You mentioned Buddy Break. You mentioned Masterpiece. Maybe yeah. tell, explain a little bit more. Like what what are the what are those ministries? What does Masterpiece encompass? Yeah. So Masterpiece really it runs. It's not a part of kids. It runs from birth until adulthood, right? Because my our oldest friend here, Stephanie, I think she's like forty seven or forty eight. So it doesn't stop when you age out of the school system. And and most of it is we have two dedicated sensory rooms at this campus that are for kids that. Um, maybe thrive in an environment where it's not as stimulating or medically fragile kids. Um, and then it runs through whether we find, they go to a typical classroom and we find buddies for them. We just had VBS for the past three weeks and each week there were at least four or five kids that had some level of disability, some requiring support, others um, maybe just an extra eye here and there to see if things are going well. Mm -hmm. um, we've got kids that are in middle school and then we've got two that are in high school that um, they would be invisible disabilities just by looking at them. You wouldn't necessarily notice. Um, and kind of working with them and their parents to try and help them like thrive in that faith community. Um, and then a part of it is this kind of stuff, like educating yeah. staff and congregation, things like that. Buddy Break is our respite program that we do during the ministry year, like once a month, which is three hours of respite where you drop um, those impacted by disability and the their other siblings and it's just three hours of mom and dad. for mom and dad or caregivers to go yeah. do whatever they want. Yeah. yeah. So That's a pretty remarkable. Industry. Yeah. yeah. So we've been doing that. I think that I looked it up. The first one was um, like 10 years ago and 21 kids. Yeah. And now pre COVID we averaged just over a hundred and now we're basically like 40 or 50 a month. Yeah. So maybe I know you have some stories to tell about this, but when it comes to disabilities in the church, What's been your experience uh, in churches and what have you observed that churches uh, do and don't do well when it comes to disabilities? Yeah, so when Kendall was first born, there was a period of time where we were really just in and out of the hospital all the time. And there were, like I said, lots of therapy visits and our schedule was pretty chaotic and we were just really focused on trying to help her. But we eventually got to a point when she was around, I wanna say like two and a half, maybe three years old, where you know, Matt, my husband and I were talking about how we could start trying to go to service again with her. And it became, um, we attempted it a couple of different times and it became really clear really quickly that that was gonna be a big, big challenge. Um, again, I think it's just um, like Chris mentioned, maybe like a lack of education or not really knowing exactly how to work with a child who has a disability. And Kendall's are quite, quite, quite complex. Her disabilities are quite complex. So, um, so that added a whole other layer into it too. Um, but it was interesting, like by, it's not interesting, it was God. My mom was actually at the park with Kendall one day after we had tried going to a couple of different churches. It just wasn't working out. Um, and she ran into Anitra Schulte, who is, whose daughter is in the Masterpiece program. And she really encouraged my mom to reach out and just say, you know what, you should try Chapel Street. They have a really great program. We love it there. We feel really safe there. And we know that Elsa is gonna be cared for when we go into service. And that was really the start of us being introduced to Chapel Street and introduced to Masterpiece. And I think if that conversation hadn't have been orchestrated, yeah. um, we might not have known about it. But I think there's just maybe a lack of understanding and perhaps even a lack of resources to be able mm -hmm. to assist um, families who just need a little bit more. Sometimes people think ministries in the church start because uh, really smart pastors get in a room and figure out what the ministry should be. That's rarely the case. It's most often because people see a need and point it out and bring their gifts to bear on it. Tell us the story of how Masterpiece even started. Yeah, I mean, Masterpiece, I, and again, I wasn't here when it was started, right? Because it's been around for a little over 10 years, but it was really a group of moms who had children with disabilities, mm -hmm. really basically, I think, beating on people's doors <laughs> in the church to being like, why aren't you addressing this? Yeah. Why aren't you addressing this? Is a need, this? Right. this is a need, right? And so statistically, Globally, 15% of the people on the planet are impacted by disability. And here in the States, um, the number is probably like more like 19%. Um, and uh, say that again. 15% for... of the people globally are impacted by disability. 
And here in the States, it's 19%. Globally, they use that number because it's, they would use profoundly or severely. In the States, we have a little bit broader definition, so that number is a little higher. 19%. I'm going to guess for most people that's significantly higher than they would assume. Yeah, it's almost twenty percent of the population. It's in the United States. It's like fifty-six point seven million people. Wow. So one in five, and that was in two thousand and ten, hmm. right? So that's a like in other literature. If you're in this space and reading about it, people would argue and make a case for that people with disabilities are the biggest unreached people group with the gospel of everyone. Wow. T say more about that. <laughs> it's just the reality, right? That that I think that there's a, there's a perception of, um, there's some perceptions that like, oh, they're disabled, so they just automatically are getting a pass in terms of this salvation thing. Some people see it as probably maybe a sin issue or which is wrong oh. theology. Yeah. Like, so there's all that kind of complexity wrapped into it. Um, and then also unreached because I'm gonna read a quote here from um, Well, Lamar. you're not just playing games? No, <laughs> oh. I'm not. Okay. So this is from Lamar Hardwick, who wrote Disability in the Church, who's a, he's not, I think he's resigned as a pastor, but he's a pastor, he had cancer, so he's kind of taken a break from that down in Atlanta, and he has autism. And it was a diagnosis that he received later in life. But it's a fairly long quote, but it's very worthwhile. It's more than 90% of church-going special needs parents cited the most helpful support to be a welcoming attitude towards people with disabilities. Meanwhile, only about 80% of those parents said that a welcoming attitude was present at their church. And then he goes on to say, when I speak of ableism um, within the church, I think we get the best picture of its impact by observing how disabled persons and their families are often treated within a church, within a church's normal operations. It's not just an assumption that people with disabilities are inferior to able-bodied people. Ableism is a system often unconscious that doesn't consider people with disabilities at all. Most church programming was, des this is the part that really like tugs at my heart. Most church programming was designed without regard for the disability community. The reason that a family with an autistic child or a young adult with vision impairment has to ask for accommodation is because the church wasn't designed with them in mind. Hmm. And that and we're talking about 19% of the population here in the United States. Yeah. So. It's, it's, it's kind of a big deal and, and, and a pretty unreached group yeah. as a whole, if we're talking in this whole evangelism kind of and that, you, you said a moment ago that was your experience as you were trying to find a place. Yeah, it, it definitely was. It was very difficult. And um, just the, like I said, the lack of understanding and just being unequipped. And I don't want to say that anyone's attitude was like uncaring or unfeeling, um, but it was just there wasn't that, to your point, Chris, that extra layer or that extra step taken to being like, okay, we're, we're faced with an issue here. We have this great little girl, we have this family and we wanna support them and come around them. How do we make this happen for them? And I don't feel really strongly that the, that conversation ever even happened. And as a result, you know, it, it kind of pushed us back into this little bubble. Mm. And I like to tell people the beautiful thing about what Masterpiece does is that it, Chris talked about Masterpiece Mom, Moms. The beautiful thing is that it brings community back mm. to our families because one of the things that can happen um, with families who are impacted by disability is you start to get very isolated and you can feel very alone. Um, we definitely experience that. You feel like you don't, people don't understand, you don't have someone to talk to. Um, you feel like you can't go to the places that you typically would go to yeah. and you're used to. Um, going just to the grocery store is like a huge event. That could be, that could be an all-day event. So you're faced with this whole new world and you, you become isolated. And I think isolation is something that can lead down a very mm -hmm. negative road. And mm -hmm. the community that's built from reaching out as a church and being willing to pull these families in and come around them and do what's necessary to give them access, just know that you're pulling us back in and you're pulling a lot of time us yeah. out of isolation and feeling alone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, a lesson for all of us in every area of life right there. Uh, Chris, you used a, a word, uh, in, well, it was in the quote, ableism. Yeah. What, what is exactly ableism? Yeah, I mean, so just like you would use the term racism or, or sexism, right, ableism, you're really just, you're not showing somebody dignity. You're not treating them as an image bearer, somebody created to be like God. Yeah. 
right? Um, you're seeing them as the other. Yeah. And so it's just another ism, right? And everybody's, these days, everybody gets all freaked out about all the isms, right? Yeah. Ableism is kind of my ism that I do not tolerate. <laughs> um, but that, that really is, it's really carrying that attitude that looking at somebody like Kendall and just making some very um, uneducated assumptions about her just by looking at her and maybe assuming what her abilities may or may not be yeah. and what value in my context, what value those actually have with kingdom purpose. Yeah. One of the things that is difficult with Kendall sometimes to that point is I mean, she's nonverbal and she struggles with eye contact. And so I think there's times when people just assume that nonverbal equals non-thinking, non-feeling, non-seeing, non, you know, uh, add your adjective <laughs> yeah. to it. And, and the truth is Kendall is incredibly smart and incredibly perceptive. And she understands a lot. <laughs> I know Chris yeah. knows this. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. I think that sometimes that idea of just not taking a moment to really see yeah. and really just stop and look. And I think that's kind of that attitude a little bit that you're describing, Chris, is just like assuming that um, there's not a person in there. Mm. And there is. Yeah. And she has Amazing feelings. Person. And yeah. 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 Well, um, so I hesitate to ask this question because I think I know. Um, I know how uh, our ministry and uh, to dis people with disabilities and, and their families began. But what, like, on the individual level, what uh, what can individuals do? Like, you you just said some things that, that that don't happen. We don't see. We don't stop. We don't engage. We, like, what what would you say to the average person, in terms of showing dignity, engaging? Yeah, I mean, I sometimes I think it's okay to acknowledge that it might be awkward the first time that you meet Kendall because. <laughs> she is nonverbal and she likes egg sandwiches and she likes really <laughs> weird music and eggs or egg salad egg, egg sandwiches. sandwiches starbucks um, egg sandwiches yeah. and she's eating us out of house and home yeah. us, so. so so though it might seem awkward the first time you meet somebody that has a disability that's different than you um i think it's fair um and right just to at least in your own self acknowledge that it, yeah it's awkward i don't know this person right. just like if you were to meet anybody on the street yeah. that you don't know Right. And I think if you do it with dignity, like if you if it's a kid and you want to ask some questions of the parents, like a lot of times if I meet like, let's say I was meeting Kendall for the first time, I may ask Kendall questions that I know that she's probably not going to give me the answers to that. Most likely Jillian is going to answer, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask Kendall right. and I'll let her. Answer. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Because it gives her the opportunity yeah. to communicate in the way that she knows how. So yeah. it's again, it's dignity, it's respect. Um, and yeah, I it is. I mean, I personally, I, I think I speak for Matt as well and our whole family is, I would rather have you ask a question and ask it totally wrong. Yeah. I'm, I would rather have you kind of fumble through it and maybe not say it exactly right than not ask the question at all because- not engage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the, some of the best interactions I've ever had has been with children at the playground around Kendall mm -hmm. who would you know, you could tell they're kind of looking and they maybe want to come over and they, I would hear them ask a question about her AFOs. She wears braces yeah. um, or her walker. Sometimes she utilized the walker and the mom or dad would just be like, well, just go ask her. And they come over and they ask. And then the second you explain it to them, that child just became her best friend mm -hmm. for the rest of the time we were at the playground. They engage, they want to know more. They want to try to do what she's doing. And so really one of the best things I can recommend is just see and don't be afraid to ask and follow the lead of little children. Right. Yeah. And, <laughs> and also, I think don't be afraid to make mistakes. Right. Right. I know. Right. I know. Uh, I often uh, will have, have struggled with that. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Yeah. I don't want to make somebody feel uncomfortable. I don't want to feel awkward myself. And so, uh, I've been tempted to like not engage. But I'm learning. So even just hearing you say you'd rather, as a mom, you'd much rather have an awkward engagement than no engagement. A hundred percent. That's good. I yeah. think that's yeah. a good lesson for all of us. Yeah. yeah. I know one of the things that, that you've been sharing with us on staff and that I'm learning is, is kind of the philosophy of Master Peace Ministry around what we call the five stages. Yeah. And again, I went, I went to college for computer engineering. I didn't go to college for, to have a ministry degree. So I don't know if this First is... First of all, he went to college. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I don't know if this is actually a philosophy of ministry in terms of like church speak, right? But what we use, something that was developed by my friend um, Dan Vanderplot over at Elam Christian Services, and it's just the five stages of disability attitudes. And it's really just kind of 
five steps that run along a spectrum that kind of help you gauge where you are at in terms of dealing with or working with or hanging around people so with to be disabilities. Clear, this, these stages are not for the disabled person, it's, it's where we are it's, in terms it's of- It's for we as the typical people engaging, where we're yeah. at, right? And so the first stage is ignorance, mm -hmm. right? So ignorance is mean, meaning I have never even met or don't, I'm unaware that I've met somebody with a disability or I actively avoid it because it's uncomfortable, yeah. right? Um, and then the next stage would be pity where it's like, man, it kind of sucks to be Kendall. I feel sorry for her. I kind of want to help her, right? So that's pity and you're starting like there you're starting to move towards the heart of Jesus a little bit, right? Because I think that Jesus does care, but that's not where it ends, right? And then, so the next stage after pity would be caring. Like I'm actually caring about somebody and I'm engaging and whether that be I volunteer or I help out on um, at a buddy break or wherever it is, right, in the community. Um, and that's caring. And again, you're really starting to see and be more like Jesus, but like Jesus didn't just walk around caring about people, mm -hmm. right? He was in relationships and proximity. So then from caring, as you get to know people and show them dignity and get to learn about Kendall and how awesome she is, right? Then you move to friendship. And that's where you're actually in relationship with people um, and are friendly with them and like do things and live in community. Um, and then from friendship, you move into co-laboring, which co-laboring means um, like, in 1 Corinthians 12, right? When you when Paul is saying, talking about parts of the body, yep. right? The parts of the body that we might think are less than or mm -hmm. that we might want to hide away, like Paul uses the word indispensable, yes. right? Those, Kendall is indispensable to the body of Christ. And that gets us to co-laboring, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where everybody, regardless of ability, is called to be a disciple and to serve. Right? And so figuring out where Kendall as she, or anybody in Masterpiece, as they start to get older, just like everybody else in middle school starts serving in preschool or yeah. starts being an usher or whatever that looks like, it's really co-laboring um, for the kingdom. And what Dan, when he wrote a book, and the book is, there are no asterisks, right? And his statement is, there are no asterisks in the Bible. So it's not like, oh, all of this in an asterisk that says, except for Kendall, or except for those with disabilities, mm -hmm. right? We're all image bearers. All of God's promises, yes. all of, the, all of yes. what God says about yeah. the, his church and his right. people. Is, and we yeah. shouldn't just assume that Kendall yeah. is less than, and so she just, we have to just stop at the pity or care, mm -hmm. right? So it's just the same again. It's ignorance, pity, pity. care, friendship, and then co-laboring. Yeah. Yeah. How, the co-laboring, I'm interested, what does that look like? Speaking to that as a mom, what, what does it mean for someone to be co-laboring with you with, with Kendall? I don't know. You need to give me the definition again, Chris. Yeah, I mean, so so co-laboring is would be you and I co-laboring right now, trying to educate and prepare a congregation for accessible worship, right? Yeah. And and so giving them a little bit of information. Um, co-laboring might look like, um, and now is when I might get a little leaky, right? Yeah. But my son Noah, who had some um, mental health challenges and some addiction challenges, um, he would tell you that what got him through a very, very dark period of his life wasn't that he felt sorry for friends like Brandon Clark or Mike Abs, right? Um, or Jasper. It's that Jasper went, who at the time was like five years old and went and visited my kid in a rehab. Or Brandon Clark, call, Brandon Clark is nonverbal, right? <laughs> um, but Brandon Clark would call the payphone at the Salvation Army and essentially scream into the phone to talk to Noah. <laughs> and, and, or, one time with the one time Noah bounced out of rehab, meaning he left. It was because Luke Abs was coming home from Ohio and Noah was supposed to serve with him, but he got put on restriction because he missed a meeting or something, which means you can't go home for the weekend, which means he couldn't serve with Luke and it crushed him because he saw he sees Luke as a friend. And so co laboring to me in that context is that um yeah, Noah helped with those guys in Sunday school, developed relationships, was friendly, but those guys in my mind the, um, were co-laboring because they saved my son's life, right? They are the ones that showed Jesus to my son, mm -hmm. not the other way around. So that that's my, one example of co-laboring. Another example would be Stephanie Pucci, who is the, my 47-year-old friend who yeah. used to live over by Willow, but then started attending church here. Um, cognitive disability. Um, she pushed for us to do the 
modified rooted group. Mm -hmm. So we took nine people through rooted, through curriculum that she kind of brought that I modified. And she was the one that was like, Duffy, when are we going to do this? Duffy, when are we going to do this? Right? Like push in and drive them the ball. But even that wanting access mm -hmm. to a small group experience yeah. that everyone else had. Yeah. 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 So those are two examples of co-laboring. It could be that you see um, Curtis ushering or being a greeter yeah. on the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday mornings. Yeah. Those are some examples. What does it feel like when you hear Chris say something like, Kendall is indispensable to the body of Christ? I mean, obviously, I, I agree <laughs> completely. <laughs> um, I, see, I see Kendall every week just... Again, I think, Chris, you, you talked maybe a little bit about this with Matt before, but this idea that, like, you know, it's very possible that Kendall may never be able to read or write, um, but what she lacks in that ability, she is able to just show love and acceptance and joy and genuine happiness and just, like, bring that to anyone that she's around. And, um, and I feel like she has the ability to be able to just show people like the heart of Christ. Like she's mm -hmm. just so, she's just accepting and loving and caring and she doesn't care who you are or what background you're from or what color mm -hmm. is your skin. She does not care. She just is, she just loves. And I think that's such a beautiful thing that sometimes gets missed. And that's why I think masterpiece is so important because there's a lot of um, a lot of families and a lot of um, kids and adults in the Masterpiece Ministry whose children are just a bright light in that way and just show people yeah. what it means to truly love yeah. without barriers and conditions and boundaries and, um, and, and just, yeah, have that, have that compassionate, loving heart. And in, in some ways, those, what Kendall and, and others um, with disabilities can communicate nonverbally, you almost... I don't know you can learn that in a book. Chris, in, in your quote from your friend, um, um, what's the name of the book again? Just in case those of us... Oh, I think the, the Dan Vanderplot, it's a PDF you can get off of the Elam site. I think it's called There Are No Asterisks. There Are No Asterisks. So meaning an asterisk next to somebody's name, they don't, the, the promises of God don't fully apply because of a disability. I, I think uh, for many of us, it's tempting to look at disabilities and think, well, this is something that's wrong maybe a result of the fall or that we should want to correct if we can and someday we'll be made right. Is that, what's wrong with that view? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's wrong with that is if you look at John 9 where there's the blind guy that gets healed, right? right. And, and, and you look at that story, the bottom line is that he was healed for really two reasons, in my opinion, right? And I think I could make a solid case that he was being healed to restore him to community, right? Mm -hmm. And to glorify God. Yeah. It wasn't a result of his sin or his parents' sin or any of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's not the fundamental thing that you walk right. away with. What I would walk away with is that, that yes, he was healed and glorified God, but a lot of people that are healed through the, throughout the Bible and those stories where they're healed, there is the physical healing, but I think even more important to those individuals, if I could get in their mind, is that they were restored to community. Yeah. And because in that, in that far eastern like culture right. it was like a bigger deal to have a disability than it is in 2024 yeah and well i think of the, the story of the healing of the leper yeah it's, an, it's impossible to be in community without the healing yeah. but jesus did, didn't heal everyone right but all are made in the image of god yeah uh, maybe um the question for someone like kendall who's nonverbal, uh, what does that mean Someday, when we're all in, in heaven, when we're, we all have our new glorified bodies and minds, she will be verbal? I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but what I like to believe is that I'm going to be able to know what's in her heart and what she's thinking. And, um, yeah. Chat. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the hardest things is knowing, and Chris, you know this because you're with her, Every, every Sunday and on body break is like, there's so much going on in there. Yeah, and yeah, people yeah. have said it all, you know, yeah. ever since she was little, it's like there's, there's these thoughts just rummaging around in there and she understands so much and she just can't get it out. And one of the things that Matt and I hope for is that one day she'll be able to tell us all of it. And yeah. it might not be verbally, right. but we might just yeah. know 
all every thought that she's had and the way that she's yeah. felt about things and we just wish for that and hope for that let me go back to what you said reply to that chris you said that all of the promises paul says we will be fully known yeah and fully loved yeah and, and we'll know fully as we're fully known yeah. so whatever that looks like there'll be no barrier i honestly those of us that aren't that are verbal still there's stuff rummaging around. Us. <laughs> yeah. We don't know how to get out. Yeah. And we need, right. There'll be no barriers to our communication yeah. uh, to, be, to be fully known and loved by God and each other. Yeah, and when I talk about that question, because it comes up in the circles that I run in, right? I don't. I would not claim to have an answer. Yeah. I would be a fool if I did that, right? <laughs> but what my hope is, and 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 not just hope, but my knowledge and what gives me peace is, I don't know which way it'll land. Can Kendall? Will Kendall be able to talk? Or will I just be able to understand her? I don't know the difference, bet- what the difference between those two would be. Well, would that even, you even care about that? Yes, right. <laughs> but my my thing is is that that people that know Kendall and, and Kendall knowing people, like she'll be able to fully communicate and she'll be able to do that brain dump of every time that I annoyed her because I didn't understand what she wanted. <laughs> or probably be a long yeah. yeah, right? Like, because like, like, Kendall understands 99.99999% of what I say, right? I don't always understand what she wants. Like when she had an earache at Buddy Break one day, she was just having a total meltdown. And I'm like, are you hungry? Do you want music? Like going through the list. And I finally am like, you have to use your communication device because I don't know what you want. And she was like, I have an earache. And I was like, okay, I'm an idiot. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I called Jillian. She's like, yeah, she has an earache. And, yeah. and the problem was, you know, solved. So my vision of eternity or heaven is that the peace that Jillian and Matt and all of us will have knowing that Kendall Each will other, be fully yeah. known. Right? Yeah. Um, and think- the other half of that is that I can speak to this not from like personal experience, but from being around parents and caregivers. Also the peace of no longer having the stress of like, do I have to carry my seizure plan with me? Do I have to, what list of information do I have to give when I leave my kid? Or what's gonna happen when, when Jillian and Matt get to the age where they're too old to take care of Kendall. Like, That's never going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> right? Like those types of things. So when I think of it, I look at it from that perspective yeah. of like being made complete. Yeah, I may have six pack abs. I don't know. But <laughs> but Kendall Love will be you will. complete. Yeah, I, I, uh, it's a, I think the holding both intention, right? Because you mentioned um, being prepared for a seizure or certain devices she needs, and and, and we don't, we keep using Kendall because you're here. Yeah. yeah. But um, there there is brokenness in the world. There are things that we. But I think what you're what I'm learning, what you're you Chris and you, Julian and and Mesh-Beast Ministry is teaching us if we're listening, is that they're not broken. Right. There there are uh, things that need to, that need to be corrected, and we want to work to do that. But there's nothing wrong with them as a person, right. as a part of the family of God. You, you, you threw a phrase out a minute ago, just in conversation, you said, uh, accessible worship. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you about what, what does that mean? What does that look like for a, for a church? Back to, like, in my vision of accessible worship is I wouldn't, I don't want to have to use that word because, yeah. again, it goes back to um, the church wasn't designed for people like Kendall mm. or Brandon Clark or Luke Abbs um, in mind, right? And so what we're trying to do is make it possible because... Like we go to Johnny, we take a team to Johnny and Friends every year, which yeah. is a family retreat, um, and they have accessible worship there. And um, it's you've been it, on me to go. I'll, yes, I'll, I'll go next year. And, and it looks different there just because of the community and that. But there are some people in that room who that's the one time a year that, as a family, they're able to worship. Hmm. Um, because whether their home church um, isn't maybe as, as, as accepting, or they're not comfortable, or hmm. can't facilitate it, or whatever it is, right? It's it's really just making, it's unfortunate that we have to do this, yeah. but it's good to do it. It's a yeah. good stretch goal to have. Yeah. Um, but it really is saying like, dude, everybody's welcome. Right. Yeah. And a Regardless lot of, times, of ability. Right. And a lot of times for our families, there's just this constant feeling of having to separate, right? Uh-huh. And it's whether, you know, if you have typical kids and then you have a child with disabilities, a lot of times you're planning things to fit each person right right? so it's like um you know we would take if one of us wants to take brooks to a movie it's just one parent and someone staying back Mm -hmm. with kendall because she can't handle that so i think um 
what I feel sometimes with accessible worship is any opportunity that we can have to keep the whole family unit together, to be able to worship and be together um, is just an amazing thing because we're so accustomed, unfortunately, to the opposite. Um, I think Johnny and Friends is just an ex a great example of what accessible worship is and, and what um, that can be and could potentially one day be at this church. Mm -hmm. It is, the, that was by far our favorite, I think our favorite part of Johnny and Friends when we went two years ago was just seeing her kind of moving up and down the aisles freely, singing the song of our people <laughs> and being able to shout and scream or make noise and not feel like everyone's looking at you or staring yeah. at you or telling, asking you to leave or anything mm. like that. She was just free to worship and we were all free to worship together. Um, and it was such a special moment and such a really special, cool memory for us. Yeah. And it does. And to me, it does go back to that, to what Paul said in first Corinthians, right? Those people are indispensable to the body of Christ. So in my mind, um, our body, our community at Chapel Street, like our faith community, right? We're lacking if those people aren't, don't have the opportunity or feel comfortable to be in the room yeah. and worship with us corporately. Because it's not just about Jillian and Brooks and Matt right. and Kendall being able to go as a family, though that's a huge it's piece. Our family. It's yeah. our family. Yeah. It's the Chapel Street family. I was family. thinking that as you said yeah. that, like, it's tempting to think, well, we want to give them access to our worship. No. That's the wrong way to think about yeah. it. It's, we, we are worshiping together yes. and we need them. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe practically, what are some things we can do at Chapel Street or just people, churches can do in general to be more accessible? Yeah, I mean, I think one of them really is, is, is the five stages. It is totally okay to start at ignorance. Like every time I meet a new friend that's coming to Buddy Break or Sunday School or even out in the community, like I'm starting at ignorance because I don't know that person, whether they have a disability or not. Yeah. Um, once you've been able to, once you've been familiar with that, that kind of attitude and in, been in proximity to people, it enables me to move through those stages a little quicker, right? Yeah. But it's still difficult sometimes. Like I do lay in bed at night sometimes and think like, what does it look like for Kendall to co-labor or other kids, um, Elena Brandonicio, what mm -hmm. is that gonna look like for Elena as she starts to mature and get into high school mm -hmm. and, and, and stuff like that? So my number one thing would be, don't be afraid to interact with somebody, right? Because yeah. if you're not in proximity to them, you're gonna always remain in ignorance. Right. And then if you start interacting, um, and even if it you're gonna make mistakes, I'm gonna say things that um, technically are inappropriate. There was it event it, it, well at adventure club one night i made a statement to a to a, a young girl um i said hey we're gonna go back in but don't act crazy which again it doesn't sound like a lot <gasps> it doesn't sound like a big deal but if you're talking to somebody who maybe has a history with mental health or mm -hmm. things like that it's a little bit insensitive to say that and so even as the director of a disability ministry i said it i caught it like I gotta, you gotta keep going and I just gotta yeah. put it in my memory bank. Yeah. Hey, I can't do that. And so I think the more proximity to ha you have to people that have disabilities and interact yeah. with them yeah. with that framework of it's okay to start at ignorance, but we have to start moving through those other stages to get to friendship and co-laboring. And from the family side of it, I would say it's also important on, from our standpoint of how we can assist with that is to not Get, not rush to judgment or get angry when a mistake is made or something is said yeah. and um, just recognize again, like I, like we were talking about before, at least, you know, at least the attempt is being made to get past ignorance and to learn more and, and be closer to this person and, and not overreact or get upset if the, something wasn't asked perfectly. And see it as an opportunity to help educate, right. help inform, because right. we're growing. Um, I think about... Um, like uh, like excessive worship in the in the broader community in the worship service itself. Um, I remember talking with um, a friend of mine uh, um, who pastors an African American church in the city, and he was saying um, often racial minorities feel like they have to they have to uh, you know adjust to yeah. white culture and worship. Yeah. I'm thinking it's something similar when it comes to like uh, uh, when it comes to accessible worship. It's going to mean we're going to have to change some things. To we, be I, I think we have to, I think ultimately it would be good to change some things, right? Um, but I think a lot of it is just level setting expectations um, from what we're, Chris Duffy and Jillian might use, be used to seeing in a church service 
It just might look a little different because Kendall gets like I will never raise my hands during a praise song because I'm just that's not how that's I roll. Disability. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a pretty stoic guy. I don't you know. Whereas Kendall is when she listens to music is like beyond expressive. It's her love language, right? <laughs> um, and so that might make some people initially feel uncomfortable, right? But I think that it grows us as a body. Like I have to be willing to stand next to somebody who worships a little bit differently right. than me. Yeah. Well, we all should be willing yeah. to do that. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. I think that's that's really important for us as we talk about doing that more. And it, we're, we're filming this in a, in a masterpiece room designed, uh, you said often we separate as a family. And I think sometimes the tension between that, we want to build rooms that are equipped to take care of unique yeah. needs. Yeah. and But we don't want as a church to be like, well, we have separate right. programs and facilities entirely for, for right. them. Yeah, yeah. the reality yeah. is Kendall probably would never, at this point, at least in her life, she wouldn't be able to sit through a, a full church service. She needs to move. She has the physical need for sensory interaction and movement. And so just to be able to have her in for a little while and then have the option, I think, again, that's one of the things that, what are we talking about? What are we doing well right now? That's something that I think we do really well yeah. is we have that great space for them, yeah. for her to then leave and yeah. be able to come here and, and just, you know, swing on the swing or, yeah. you know, roll around or do what she needs to do, get her wiggles out. Um, but to know that that's even available is a step in the right direction. There was a couple of questions I still want uh, your perspective on. One we've, we've touched on, and that's uh, what does um, being a parent of a child with disabilities, working uh, with a disabled, um, what has it taught you about the heart of God? How has it changed your relationship with Christ? Yeah, I mean... That's a that's a lot. I'm just trying to make Duffy cry. Yeah, that's a lot. I, it's a lot because I like one of the phrases that I hear people say that kind of, and I don't think it should rub me the wrong way, but sometimes it does. Is like, oh, you're serving the least of these or things huh. like that. To some extent, that might be true of Kendall because, or some of the other people that are disabled. I struggle with it because I don't see them as the least of these. Mm. Um, but it really has opened up a guy that looks like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I am not necessarily what you would consider the face of like a welcoming masterpiece ministry, something, you know? <laughs> um, but it really does go back to like God taking a heart of stone and turning it into a heart of flesh. Cause I am ride or die with my disability <laughs> friends. <laughs> like, yeah. And and that's and that's comes from a, a place of number one, God has equipped me to do it because I have absolutely no natural ability yeah. to do this. Like it just doesn't exist yeah. within me. Um, so there's the equipping piece that is, it's amazing to see that that's happened in my life. Um, and it it also is like a heart, like a transformation to see because I, I would say I've been a, I've had people in, with disabilities in my life. I go back all the way you know to junior high or high school. Um, but to see um, Kendall and others in Masterpiece, all of them, um, as image bearers, mm -hmm. right? And as like, like indispensable to the body. They're reflecting to yeah. you. Yeah. Um, maybe when Jesus says, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done for me, he doesn't see any of us as the least of these, but he's referring to what maybe the rest of the world. Right, and, that, and that's part of it, right? Some of it is my own, like, wrapping it up in my own brain, getting but twisted. I like, I like that you're, you're reminding us that <laughs> there are no least of these, yeah. or we're all the least of right. these. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, I had absolutely no idea um, what we were getting into after Kendall was born. And um, mm. for especially the first year, we were in just like full on survival mode. Um, but I think what we learned through that was that we didn't have anywhere else or anything else to go to but God. Mm -hmm. That was it. Um, and we just leaned so hard into, into that to just get, not necessarily just get through it, but because we couldn't do it in our own strength. We had no idea what we were doing, mm -hmm. none. And so it was basically living every single day in prayer. Yeah. But I think there's some, I look back on that time in our life and I think what's really cool about that is you know, now that I can reflect is that um, that was really this time when like you just, it's all out on the table. Like 
I can't do this without you, Lord. Like you have to hold me in this and guide us and tell us what to do because we don't know what to do. And, you know, I personally have never heard God audibly speak to me, but what I did feel and what I know my husband felt was just this constant feeling of being loved and held. And I'm, you knew he was there for us in it. Um, and that's, that's just something that feeling that we take with us now. And I mean, again, we have struggles every day. Every day is a challenge um, and presents new and exciting challenges. But I go back to that time and I always remind myself, like, we are not made to do this in our own strength. Yeah. Any of it. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and any time that we are struggling, it's, we just have to bring it to God. And that's something that Kendall, whether she knows it or not, right. one day she'll tell us in heaven that she knew it, but she, um, knew, all she knew all along. But um, but that's something that we've yeah. learned now as uh, as being a family that's been impacted by disability. Yeah. Thank you. Not even when Kendall sings, you don't hear the audible voice of God. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, it's encouraging to think about. Um, I'm tempted to what my learning about God to be in the scriptures, studying, and there's so much, which is great, but there's right. so much he wants to show, teach us about himself through relationships, and, and yeah, so thank you. Uh, maybe tell us, uh, I want to go back, um, so we don't all just break down here. Uh, you said uh, it's okay to start with ignorance. That's all right, acknowledging that, where you are, but I'm pretty sure you would say it's not okay to stay there. I would definitely say it's yeah. okay to stay there. So if we're, if we're moving uh, to pity, to care, um, maybe some practical things, the people that are, who are watching what to do, what, 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 give, give us some advice on steps they can take as individuals that we as a church. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, the way that I got, quote unquote, sucked into this, right? Mm -hmm. The way that God pushed me into this direction is I literally just showed up. Mm -hmm. I had no expectations of what I was going to be doing. Um, I had no idea what respite even meant. Yeah. Like I was yeah. completely ignorant and I literally just showed up and served at Buddy Break. Mm -hmm. And from that, you know, the first couple times then I was just hooked, yeah. right? Um, and then that slowly grew. Um, like I think God continued to soften my heart and equip me and give me skills that I didn't have or didn't know that I had. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the biggest step is just showing up, yeah. right? Um, and actually just reaching, like going into those uncomfortable spaces, right? Okay, like so I'm you're never the director of Matchbase. <laughs> yes. Tell us how we can yeah. show up. So showing up would be volunteer at Buddy Break, right? right. If people want to, if they're interested, shoot me an email. During the ministry year, we have almost once every month. Um, we do events like every Sunday. We have Sunday school for kids that are in this sensory room or the one downstairs. We also need buddies at um, that go into Sunday school rooms. VBS, the, we just finished up three weeks of VBS, right? And so at North Aurora, um, for week one, I needed two buddies, right? Because I had two kids there out of 40, just to give you some context. Last week, I think there were um, five or six kids that quote unquote, during registration, check the box that say, hey, I'd, I did, I'd like some support for Masterpiece. Um, and then this week, I think we had four. Mm. And, and that means that I need, it's one on one, right? So that's four people that have to commit so that a kid like Oliver can go to VBS, right? Mm -hmm. um, Adventure Club, which is during the ministry year, every Wednesday night, we've got kids that come to Adventure Club that that need support. Um, and then you, you don't have any training. Yeah, there's no training. Like <laughs> education, you'll nope. do that. No, nope. yeah. So if you want to show up, yes, reach you know, out to Chris Duffy. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer. Um, or like even an Elevate, right? Like Elsa, who you mentioned, Anitra. Like Elsa did Elevate, I think, for two or three years. And that means that I that we, as a, as a church, need to provide a little bit of support for Elsa to participate um, yeah. in Elevate, which is our performing arts ministry, mm -hmm. right? So there's tons of different pockets where we can get you plugged in. So yeah, just reach out and I will... Yeah definitely hook you up. And from the family perspective, I can't say enough of how just like a little act like that, just being like, you know what, let's find a buddy for Elsa or mm -hmm. um, for Kendall or for Jasper or whoever and, and allow them to do something 
to help them grow or get outside of their comfort zone or allow them to interact with typical peers and typical members of our church. Like that little tiny act of just being there and of seeing how can I help do that, I can't even tell you how much that means to our family and families like ours. Yeah, and we do and we do need people to show up because a lot of it is one on one, meaning if there's one Kendall, there's gotta be one yeah. servant. Yeah. Um, and so for in order for Kendall or any of these kids to experience some of these things that we do, it takes bodies. Yeah. And a lot of those bodies are high school kids that serve. A lot of them are adults, mm-hmm. right? But the more the merrier. Chris, you, you told us to, to show up and volunteer and that you need bodies, you need people to show up. But I'm guessing, uh, well, the temptation is to think, I'm going to show up because they need me. Um, flip it around for us. Well, how have you seen people who have served in and masterpiece be impacted themselves. Yeah, I mean, like if we talk about high schoolers, like I can think of like three specific, three or four that kids that have gone through masterpiece probably started serving when they were in middle school, um, and then have gone all through high school. So Sarah McAvoy's one, um, Jamie Byers another one. They're going to college to be sped teachers, like the, that the, the, special ed teachers. Okay, yeah. that's that's their career path, and they're wow. both like rock stars at it. Um, So that would be one example, or Pastor Bruce McAvoy, right? Um, In the disability space, he probably would have, um, he would just tell you, he was at ignorance and kind of was comfortable there. Happily ignorant. Yeah, Yeah. until his daughter Sarah dragged him to Johnny and Friends. Mm -hmm. Um, And now he- If you know Bruce, ask him, he'll tell you the story. Yes, and and now Bruce has gone from, from just blatantly saying I'm ignorant and I'm very uncomfortable in this space to being, I would argue, one of the biggest advocates for getting our missions, the team that goes to Johnny and Friends every year mm-hmm. off the ground and showing up. Yeah. Um, so those are some high school kids. That's a that's a pastor who's been, how long has Bruce been at church? 27 years? Yeah, long time. You know, and so even he started at ignorance, but he took it seriously yeah. and, and kind of moved through that pathway. And I think it's, it's, I think Bruce would tell you it's made him different, and I know Sarah and Jamie would. Serving in general is good for your heart, but particularly serving um, with Masterpiece Ministry will, will impact um, you in, in a way you probably can't, can't quantify until you do it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Any, anything you want to just share as we, you know, as a church, we're trying to continue to grow. Uh, we're not done. We want to represent the full spectrum of the, the body of Christ and the image of God. Anything else you'd want to share with with us before we wrap up? I mean, as the director of disability ministry, right, I'll acknowledge Chapel Street is ahead of other churches, right? So I'm very, very happy and proud that we're in that spot. But for parents that have kids impacted by disability, I have to acknowledge we're also not all the way there, right? Um, So I would, I'm really happy that we're in this Base that we're in, I enjoy a little bit of the uncomfortable tension, knowing that I have to be the one that kind of advocates for some of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also would say to some of the parents who maybe have had or will have frustrations within my ministry, right? It's going to happen that they would they would extend a little bit of grace to us, just like they would if I had an awkward question about Kendall. Right. Yeah. No. I think I think we are in a in a good place to keep growing. I would say mm-hmm. there's a lot of things that. I had mentioned before, I think there's a lot of things that we do really well and that we do right. Um, and I would just encourage, um, or I would just encourage people to just see. Hmm. And I think that's a great first step. You know, don't walk past, don't look down, don't look away. Just start by just opening Excellent. your eyes and seeing. Um, you'll see Kendall pretty much every Sunday, either rolling or walking yeah. <laughs> down the hallway. Following the music. Following yeah. the music, wherever the music teacher's at. Um, and just, just smile. Hmm. I mean, just start with that. And I think that you will find that the more you look and see, the more your heart opens up to, you know, what can I potentially do here? Where can I fit in in this picture in this family's life? That's, a, that's just really good advice for us on across the board. Start looking and seeing what God is doing and how I can be involved. And we, we as a church are committed to making what God is doing in Masterpiece more visible so that we can really see. So thanks for joining us for this conversation and you'll be seeing and hearing more about it in the future.